Just because 95% of the world believes something doesn't make it true. After all, at one point, 95% of people thought the earth was flat. In this video, we are talking about fasting, and not the intermittent kind. Where intermittent fasters usually fast and feed over the course of a day, this video is on extended fasting, fasts that last between 24 and 72 hours typically. You heard that right, not eating for 24 to 72 hours. Why even fast this way? Well, as recently as a couple years ago, most people saw fasting as mainly a religious and spiritual act. Recently though, fasting has been growing in popularity. Aside from a whole range of reported health and cognitive benefits, it is also being utilized by many as a fat loss tool. One single fast can drop several pounds of fat, which gets some people very excited. However, with its rise in popularity and seemingly extreme nature, many people are wondering if it is the right option for them. A major point of pushback is with people who have spent time growing their muscle mass. They are looking to cut body fat, but they are concerned that fasting will negatively impact their muscle. First, let's be clear. All weight loss diets can be boiled down to one simple concept. You are reducing your calorie intake, thereby eating less calories than you burn. This forces your body to tap into that fat to make up the difference. Converting this fat into energy reduces your fat mass while making up the additional energy you need. In order to evaluate fasting as a way to lose fat for people interested in still preserving their muscle, we need something to compare it against. Since the goal here is fat loss with a consideration for maintaining muscle, it only makes sense to compare fasting against another similarly effective method of weight loss. A typical cutting diet, which has participants eating less calories than they consume daily, meaning they schedule their macros so their deficit shows up at the end of each day. This means that day after day, their body is constantly in a state of malnutrition. It was long held that this was actually far and away the best way to lose fat while maintaining muscle. The idea was that eating at a constant deficit would cause you to lose fat but keeping protein and calories from dropping too low would help preserve muscle. Fasting, on the other hand, involves creating a deficit, but just on a larger time scale. While someone on a traditional cut is in a daily deficit, someone doing periodic fasts is looking at the bigger picture, creating perhaps a weekly deficit. At the end of the week, they are in a deficit, but there may be days in that week where their body still benefited from the physiological effects of being in a surplus. During your fasting window, your body continues to burn calories. It just now needs to turn to stored fat to get them. This is why, in as little as 72 hours, you can lose 1-2 to two pounds of fat. This level of weight loss could take 2-4 to four weeks on a traditional cutting diet. Now the core fear is that during these extended windows of not eating, muscle might degrade more rapidly than it would if you lost the same amount of fat by maintaining a constant deficit over several weeks. People believe that something about an extended period with no food causes more muscle loss. But what does the science say? Well, it may come as a shock, but not only has it been studied and proven that this isn't really the case, but fasting may actually be better at maintaining Wrong. muscle. Because Wrong. Do you have something to say? Fasting means not eating anything. That means no protein. Have you ever read a fitness magazine? Muscle is made of protein. You even said it yourself in your stupid Logan Paul video that in order to build muscle, you need X grams per day. So obviously, if you don't eat protein, your muscles will shrink away. Okay, I agree dietary protein is definitely necessary to build new muscle. But to think that if you aren't constantly eating protein, You'll lose all your muscle you already built is just insane. Oh yeah? Why is that? It's easier if I just show you. Where are we? 5,000 years ago, in an alternate reality dimension. See that tribe down there? In this dimension, their bodies work according to your logic. Well, they look pretty fit to me. That muscle isn't for vanity. This is the wild. They gather food by climbing trees and collecting eggs. The nests are very high up and hard to reach. Luckily, the human body does something called muscle protein synthesis. 
When muscles are pushed to their limit, sensors on the muscles send growth signals. Back in ancient times when this mechanism evolved, every activity people did was about survival. So if a muscle was being pushed to its limit, it meant survival was at stake. This is how they adapted to have muscles large and strong enough to reach the top of the tree. But, uh-oh. What? Well, it looks like there were no eggs today. So what? They can get eggs tomorrow or the next day. I'm sorry, I'm afraid that's not possible. As I told you, in this dimension, their bodies work the way you described. It takes muscle to reach the nests. That's why their bodies adapted to put it on. But remember, without getting constant food and protein, their muscles are going to shrink away. Even if they can still re reach the top by tomorrow, the eggs might not be back for a few days. Now that you put it that way, if muscle is all about survival, it would be pretty dumb if after a few days of not eating, it all disappeared. If anything, the muscle was put on to help survive. This is the most important time to keep it. Now you're thinking. Well, that example was a bit extreme. Hopefully you see my point. In ancient times, muscle wasn't just for looks. It helped us survive. With food insecurity and going hungry common, we should expect that our body would have developed systems to maintain muscle during these forced fasts. If anything, going a few days without eating, then refeeding fully, sounds like something our body would be more familiar with based on our history. I mean, what are the odds our tribal ancestors happened to constantly find food day after day, but it always happened to be 300 to 500 calories short of what they needed? If you want more proof that feeding and fasting is something our bodies are better equipped to handle, look at the way the Swahili Bushmen live. Often studied by researchers, they continue to live in a way which anthropologists believe is similar to the way our ancestors lived. Studying them gives us insights into our ancestors' habits. They regularly go days without eating while they are pursuing and tracking. Here's a short quote from a researcher who lived with them in the 1930s. During lengthy hunts, the hunters might eat very little, if anything. They often traveled very far and under extreme conditions. She recounted one story where they went eight days before finding any food. Then, once they reached an animal, they still had to have sufficient strength to fight it. Okay, so what's really happening during these fasts? Why don't we lose muscle? Well, to understand, we're going to need to take a quick lesson on hormones and what happens to them when you fast. Specifically, human growth hormone and IGF-1. Now, this part might start to sound familiar because you'll hear a lot of YouTubers talking about growth hormone and fasting, but they are almost never being fully forthcoming. Usually, they will say something like this. Fasting boosts growth hormone production, leaving you to imagine your body being filled with super physiological levels of some amazing muscle-promoting hormone. Listening to them can make it sound like fasting is almost the same as steroids. Well, as usual, there's a bit more to it. To understand what is going on, we need to take a look at the bigger picture. The story of growth hormone release starts with the interactions of two hormones. This is detailed in a fantastic study from 1992 published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. The first of these hormones is responsible for triggering the release of growth hormone and is aptly named growth hormone releasing hormone. The other is called somatostatin or also sometimes called growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Throughout the day and night, there are periodic releases of growth hormone releasing hormone, which should trigger the pituitary gland to release little blips of growth hormone. However, sometimes this doesn't work. While sometimes a secretion of growth hormone releasing hormone triggers a burst of growth hormone release, if GHIH, growth hormone inhibiting hormone, that somatostatin we talked about, is being secreted at the same time, it cancels out the effects of the growth hormone releasing hormone, and growth hormone isn't released. The result is small blips of growth hormone being released throughout the day into the bloodstream. What makes it even more difficult to study though, is once released, growth hormone doesn't stick around very long. The half-life is quite short. In this study, the average half-life of growth hormone in the blood was just 18 minutes. The researchers had to check the subject's blood every 5 minutes to be sure they were catching all the little blips that were released before they would disappear. Across the 24 hours, the mean serum concentrations of growth hormone in the blood of well-fed subjects was about 2 micrograms. 
Levels over the day looked something like this. Here's where it gets interesting. They then put the subjects on a three day fast. After two days of fasting, they remeasured over the final 24 hour period of the fast and the impact of the fasting was huge. Mean levels of growth hormone in the blood increased by threefold, up to about 6.7 micrograms per liter. After a closer look, they found that the pituitary gland had kicked into overdrive. Not only did the number of blips of growth hormone release double, the average size of each blip increased as well. This is where most YouTubers leave off. They've told you that fasting increases the release of some hormone with growth in the name, tell you it's a good thing, and move on. But why is this happening? Why is it good? And what does it have to do with maintaining your muscle? Well, as far as why it's happening, science isn't entirely sure, but the mechanism is hypothesized to be a result of an increase in that growth hormone release stimulating hormone and a simultaneous decrease in that somatostatin, which suppresses the release as we talked about. As far as the benefits go, it actually turns out evidence for growth hormone itself impacting muscle growth and maintenance is mixed. A 1988 study I referenced suggested that growth hormone may indirectly protect muscles by helping the body mobilize fat for fuel and also support the liver in generating small amounts of necessary glucose. And while some studies have found that growth hormone increased muscle protein synthesis, others found no real effect on it. So what is happening? Well, remember how I mentioned that growth hormone doesn't stick around very long once it enters the bloodstream? One reason for this is because when it reaches the liver, it is transformed into another hormone known as IGF-1. Unlike growth hormone, IGF-1 has a robust backing of scientific evidence supporting its important role in the building and maintenance of muscle to the point where injectable IGF-1 is a controlled substance under anti-doping laws. There are several well-studied pathways which allow for muscle growth and maintenance. IGF-1 is deeply rooted in many of them, including mTOR, P70SK6, AKT, and more. This is also where the bros aren't wrong about protein. It turns out circulating IGF-1 levels are highly correlated with your protein intake. Aha, see? Low protein means low IGF-1, when you fast, you're getting no protein, so fasting will destroy muscle. Because of the relationship between IGF-1 and protein intake, IGF-1 levels in the fasted state should go through a major drop, that's true. But strangely, the research shows that while they reduce a bit, they don't plummet. And this gives us a clue as to what is really happening here. By kicking into overdrive producing growth hormone, the body isn't directly maintaining muscle. But by upping the production rate of growth hormone, the liver has more to make IGF-1 from. And the drop in this important muscle-supporting hormone, IGF-1, is significantly reduced. The body knows that without protein intake, IGF-1 levels will drop, which would risk our muscles. So it is compensating for this by releasing additional growth hormone to make up for some of this difference. To test this out and confirm, researchers conducted a study Remember when we talked about the two hormones which control growth hormone release? Researchers took eight subjects and put them through several tests. Once during regular feeding as a control, and once after a 40-hour fast. Then, for a third test, they did another 40-hour fast. But researchers injected the subjects with somatostatin, that same hormone we talked about which blocks the release of growth hormone. Since somatostatin affects several hormones, they made sure to replace everything but the growth hormone. This way, they could measure what would happen to IGF-1 levels during a fast if growth hormone release didn't start spiking. First, they measured the baseline well-fed levels of IGF-1. Then, the subjects did a 40-hour fast, and while the levels changed, it wasn't very significant. But in the group whose growth hormone levels were prevented from going through the natural fasting increase, their levels of free and total IGF-1 were 35 and 70% lower. And just to tie everything together, the researchers also measured for muscle protein breakdown. When the subjects fasted and had their growth hormone spike suppressed, there was a 50% increase in the markers of muscle breakdown versus the fasting group who had the natural growth hormone spike. So when people tout the benefits of elevated growth hormone, they're missing the point. 
since most of the benefits of growth hormone lay in the fact that it becomes IGF-1. IGF-1 levels being propped up thanks to the added growth hormone is what should be really praised. So now the real question is, do the systems that kick in during fasting do a good enough job of helping maintain lean mass that fasting is a viable option for those who want to lose fat while maintaining their muscle gains? Well, this brings us to our final study, which is actually a review. They looked at several weight loss studies where participants used a fasting protocol and compared the results with studies where participants lost weight via traditional calorie restriction. One thing that jumped out at the researchers was that the participants were able to lose an impressive amount of weight fairly quickly. In just two to three weeks, male and female participants lost 3% and 4% of their body weight respectively, amounts that actually took longer to lose on many of the daily calorie restriction diets. Ultimately though, both daily calorie restriction and the periodic fasting groups lost similar amounts of body weight over their trials. Doesn't sound so good for fasting, right? Well, hold on, because everything changed when they took a deeper look and focused not just on body weight loss, but on what kind of weight they lost. During the daily calorie restriction diets, the body weight participants lost comprised on average 75% fat and 25% lean mass. Whereas when you look at the groups who lost their weight through periodic fasting, they might have lost the same amount of body weight, but the ratio was different. On average, 90% of what they lost was fat, and only 10% was lean mass. So while both groups lost similar amounts of body weight, the group which did periodic fasts maintained more lean mass much of which is muscle. It seems like these fasting groups experienced the best of both worlds in many ways. They dropped fat quite quickly. Thanks to the hormonal processes we talked about, their muscles were mostly protected when they fasted. And they still benefited from being in a calorie surplus on the days they didn't fast. In some of the diets, they ate up to 10% more calories over their daily burn on the days they weren't fasting. This is the beauty of these periodic fasts. Participants are able to lose body fat quite quickly while keeping most of their muscle. Then, over the rest of the week, they could benefit from being in a calorie surplus and replenish any muscle they may have lost. Unlike the cutters, whose body starved day after day after day. If this is something you're interested in, I would also recommend doing some resistance training during your fast. This triggers various pathways which will further help protect your muscle. While this video may have convinced you to try fasting, there is still a lot more you should know. I haven't even gotten into most of the benefits, the psychological effects, and the best practices. If this is something you're interested in, I can put together a more comprehensive video guide. One thing you should be aware of is during a fast, your body will become more sensitive to sugars, which is why I always like to break my fasts with fats and proteins. But these aren't always the easiest to cook well. Chicken breasts can come out dry, and it's always tricky to get your steak done just how you like it. While most of you know I make these videos for fun, I actually do have a day job. We sell a sous vide cooking device. It's a small, compact device, which allows you to precisely cook amazing meals on your schedule. Imagine coming home to juicy chicken breast after a good lift, or breaking your fast with a perfectly cooked steak. We are launching on Amazon this November, and if you're interested in learning more, I've put a link in the description. If you haven't heard of sous vide before, check it out. It's basically like science meets the kitchen. Also, if you're interested in keeping up with me, you can follow my personal Instagram. Most of my followers are just my friends and they have no idea I do this YouTube stuff, but you're welcome to follow me and make them super confused as to how I suddenly have more friends. Anyway, that just about wraps us up. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope it was able to clear up whatever question led you to click on this video in the first place. Until next time, D-Man, signing off.